Well, we're going to take a slight turn now with image number eight. This is a painting I did when I was quite discouraged because of the divisions in our country and the hot tempers that were there and how families and couples were in different places on politics and relationships were being affected. Anyway, I was feeling quite uh, a bit of sorrow for our world. And so I was reading a poem by Gerard Manley Hopkins, who was an English poet and a Jesuit priest. And one of his poems is called The Grandeur of God. And the last two lines of the poem I'll read to you. The Holy Ghost over the bent world broods with warm breast and with awe bright wings. And it came to me to paint this uh, picture of the pelican. The legend of the pelican is that if there is no food for the chicks, the mother will open up her own breast and give her blood to the chicks. And it's been adopted as an image of Christ giving his life for us. It's also uh, an idea of the Ouroboros, which is a circular symbol of a snake with its tail in its mouth. It's continually devouring itself and being reborn from itself, an emblem of wholeness. Our dyings and risings bringing our wholeness when we're conscious. And so this is a painted prayer for our nation and for the world at this time. And it's a reminder that a power greater than ourselves is at work for good. And so there's the warm breast and the bright wings. And if you look very closely, you'll see the uh, warm breast mirrored around the outside of our earth. That there is that power greater than ourself for good that is at work in the middle of all this that we might even call evil. That's really beautiful. I really love that image and also your explanation of it. And we need to think about that and what's holding us together. Yes. Definitely. So we're talking about wholeness now and moving into wholeness. And uh, I'm going to read from paragraph 193 from Mysterium because this pointed a way to wholeness for me. And he says, if attention is directed to the unconscious, the unconscious will yield up its contents, and these in turn will fructify the conscious life, a fountain of living water. And so I began to realize that if I would pay attention to my unconscious, that perhaps that would help to bring life back to me. And right about that time, Skip was talking about women who run with the wolves. And we can go to slide 32. So Clarissa Pinkola Estes wrote this wonderful book back in the 80s called Women Who Run with the Wolves. But it would be just as good today as it was then. And Skip was talking about chapter three, which is a story about Vasilisa, the wise. And it's a story of an individuation for women. And in that story, a dying mother gives a pocket doll to her daughter, Vasilisa. And she says to the daughter, should you lose your way or be in need of help, ask the doll what to do. You will be assisted. Keep the doll with you always. Do not tell anyone about her. Then the, the, the doll will jump up and down in her pocket if she's headed for trouble. So I began to allow intuition to make simple choices for me. For instance, while I was in bed, I had a variety of books that whatever mood I was in, I would pick one of them up and read it. And so I looked at that pile of books and I paid attention to a felt sense within. And when I came to a book where I felt, it felt like my heart opened a little bit, or there was a little more enthusiasm for that book than the others, I picked that book up and read it. And by golly, it was just exactly what I needed to read at that particular time. 
And so I began to shift from ego making decisions to intuition making decisions. One particular event I remember that uh, made it so clear to me how important this is. Uh, my daughter wanted me to have a little wrist cell phone so that if I needed help, I could press the button and get help. And they, I needed to have a neighbor or two on a list with this company in case they could come over and help me. So I invited a neighbor over to ask if he and his wife would be on my call list. And I had 10 minutes before he came over and I went to intuition, shall I do my email now or shall I read something? And it seemed like I was being drawn to read something. So I read for about 10 minutes. He came. We had our talk. He agreed to that, that he and his family would be supportive. And then I went to my email and I got notice of a, a death notice of one of my very best friends. And of course, that took me to a deep, sad place. And what a difference that would have been in our interview if I had been talking with him out of that depression over the loss of my friend. But instead, the intuition had led me to that book, which I read for 10 minutes. So let it, shifting the ego out of the decision-making power and letting the intuition help me. The body was part of that, the sensing the body opening, expansion in the body when I was trying to decide what to do. Like now I might make a list of something and look at the list and see what I'm drawn to do and do it at that time in that order. So that that intuition actually gives us timing, the right thing to do at the right time. Now it's easier for me as a retired person than someone with little children or have a 12-hour schedule or whatever. But you can do it in a simple way to start just a little bit. Definitely. That's, you know, I, I wish I had known these things when I was young, very honestly, because I could have made a lot better decisions going through life if I'd understood to pay attention to my unconscious. I mean, I, I had a young man approach me this morning and he said, you know, I don't, listen to my dreams because I'm afraid of what they'll say. And I was, man, you got to, you got to pay attention because that's, uh, that's your three and a half billion year old man inside you. That's kept you and all your ancestors alive for the last three and a half billion years. And it knows better than you do what you need. And so you really have to, pay attention to those things that's its only way of getting messages to you is through the imagery of your dreams and your your living your waking visions and by waking visions i don't mean something biblical but just uh as you're going along doing your life and all of a sudden some idea comes into your head or some image that has been in your life before you should be taking paying attention to that because it's your psyche, your deep unconscious telling you something it thinks you need to know. And the only language it has is those images. And so you have to pay attention to those. And it doesn't yes. mean that it's always right. And so we have to remember that we have to live in the 21st century. And so it may not be right at that particular time. And so your ego has to make a decision about what's appropriate and what isn't in yes. your 21st century life. But still, you know, your unconscious is constantly telling you, your, your self, your God image is constantly telling you what it thinks you need to stay alive and thrive. Literally, that's what, that's what it's trying to do. And if you ignore those things, then you don't get the benefit of that. Yes, that is so true. 
And I just want to reemphasize too that the body also, the felt yes. sense in the body also can be a form of guidance as well. Yeah, those those are images also coming from. That's one of the ways, you know, you know, prickly feelings on the back of your neck or whatever it is, or uh, an elevated heart rate or something like that. I, you know, in the last hour I was communicating with a friend who is having her meds adjusted for her hypertension and you know she was having certain feelings that were telling her you know you better get to the doctor and get your meds adjusted and the last time that that happened uh, she had her meds adjusted but it was the wrong medicine and three hours later she was almost dead and oh my. Uh, because she was allergic to the medicine, but yeah. fortunately, her her husband was a veterinarian, so he was enough familiar with physical health, so he knew what he had to do to help her at that time. But we really have to pay attention to the messages of our body. And, yes. You know, so we're going to shift into something new here, and this is what I call the arising of the divine feminine, and we can go to image number 10. One morning I was out in the garden, and the sun was just coming up over the hills, and it was shining on this rose, and it caught me. It was an archetypal image for me, and I ran, got my camera, took the picture, and then I had this experience that I called the arising of the divine feminine. I had a sense in which there was this being, a feminine being, like God was a, a feminine being. And this rose captured for me that feeling of what the divine feminine would be. And... This has been an image for me to help me remember and go back to this particular experience. And we could go to image 11. This was a dream I had. It was a numinous dream in December 30th of 2018. And this is an androgynous figure, about 20 to 30 feet tall, very alien and looking directly at me like I had to look back. But the, because it was androgynous, I was able, when I, the Divine Feminine arose, to say, is this the feminine aspect of this image from my dream? Is this the feminine aspect of the self? And as soon as I thought that, I experienced this sense of unity with the divine feminine wow that's very powerful <laughs> incredible so yes yeah go ahead right okay so i ran across a prayer i prayed in 1996 and we're in 2019 so that was 23 years ago and this was my prayer dear god come into this desire for union and grant your vital divine seed grow in the place of my being until I am whole and you are liberated in me. And so this is what was starting to happen in this rebirth process, this sense of wholeness, because the divine feminine joined with the divine masculine and with me. And I'll talk a little more about that later. But wow. it was uh, my woman's soul was fully received. I'd grown up in the patriarchal male trinity, and there hadn't been a place for me as a woman, and I hadn't even thought that it mattered. But then in this experience of encountering the divine feminine, finding myself fully mirrored, fully, uh, I mean, it was like I could breathe for the first time. But it was a spiritual birth. And I just want to point out some of the uh, ways we know we're encountering the feminine in our life. When we walk in the sunshine and feel the warmth on our skin, when we relish the colors of the earth, when we respect our bodies, when we wake up to the music of life, when we listen to our dreams, 
when we show affection to people we love, when we build relationships and affirm each other and express our feelings of love and devotion to each other. These are just some of the ways that we encounter the divine feminine if we move in that way. And in today's world that is so fast paced, so technologically oriented, we're talking on cell phones, we're doing emails, uh, things are so much digital, we're missing the human uh, personal factor. And that's an aspect of the divine feminine. Right. And we need this so much right now because for the last 25 or 30 years, we've been presented with movies that have ever larger weapons in them. And it makes it sound like everything can be solved with a big weapon uh, or, you know, by blowing something up. And so very often the so-called hero's journey is a very typical thing like you saw in Star Wars where there's a battle and then Luke Skywalker gets to march into the Grand Assembly Hall and everybody's cheering and he gets some sort of medal and as if that meant anything. I mean, it does mean something, but the problem is that, you know, yeah, then what, right? Because, yeah. you know, because... In Star Wars, I don't think Luke had a very happy life, actually, if you look at all nine episodes. And so, you know, we have to learn how to have a family, too. And I think this is something that's desperately missing in Hollywood, by and large. I mean, there have been a few movies lately, but... I think we have gotten a little bit one-sided and, and over-weighted things like weaponry because, uh, for example, the weapons that you see people carrying around, these huge things, you know, even the U.S. Marines don't carry weapons like that. That's just ridiculous. And, and uh, you know, what's what's the use of them? And... If you're going to have a battle, beat the enemy, and then everything is destroyed around you, then what have you got, right? Right, exactly right. All right, we could go to slide number 12. So we were reading this book, The Mysterium Lectures, by Edward F. Edinger, along with the Mysterium Conjunctionis. And during this period, I ran across this. Edinger says, the wounding has actually been valuable because it promotes an enlargement and regeneration of the personality. And so that was affirmation to me that this breakdown that I had, this wounding, was actually very valuable. And I was beginning to experience having that divine feminine arise, my psyche expanding, my personality expanding, my joy of life returning, and Tony Wolf, in an essay called Structural Forms of the Feminine Psyche, you can find that on Google. On page 15, she says, the woman who can intelligently submit herself to a process of change will find her proper place in this modern world and will fulfill her cultural task. And I think these interviews we've been doing has been like the beginning of me fulfilling my task of being able to share my story with others that it might be of help. I feel that absolutely. And I've had any number of people already say that sort of thing to me uh, about these particular interviews. And I can only tell you that I feel privileged to be the male part of this, <laughs> the male part of this to have you share this with us because I think it's so powerful and so important. Yes. Um, now I'm going to talk about a sensitive subject, uh, sexuality, feminine sexuality. And the reason I'm going to be doing this is because when the divine feminine came up, it was not just 
a, a spiritual experience, but the body itself, shame around the genitals had to be addressed and released. And so I had been going through a class with Mirabai Star about the goddesses, and she had encouraged us to select a goddess and get to know her. And so I did, and I did a reflection paper, and I picked Gaia, goddess of earth, because many times when I am praying, I'll take a little globe in my hands as I'm praying for maybe the people who are being persecuted in India, or recently there was news of little children, four years old, mining rare earth, working seven days a week, long hours. And so when I hear of something like that, it helps tactily to have that globe in my hands. So I thought of Gaia as earth as my mediator. And, and of course, when you say rare earth, you're talking about something that's radioactive, probably. So it's not... I don't know. I know that they're used in our cell phones and our technology, yeah, I, possibly in computers. Right. I think this is a kind of uranium or something like that. So having four-year-old children mine it is really a dastardly thing. They're, they're paid only pennies. And they get very little to eat. So these are things that I go into prayer. I go to a very deep place that's energetically connected in the collective unconscious. And bring those children in that situation and the people involved into that energetic place of wholeness where God is one. And just be present to that. And I have a sense of something happening. Who's to say for sure? But my, my experience is both embodied and spiritual that a change is taking place. And of course, we're next Monday going to be talking about the connection between Jungian psychology and quantum physics. Yes, and, that's right. And physicists are starting to see that there are these connections and they do relate to the physical world as well as the atomic world. Well, that's the physical world too, but, but the point is things that we used to th think were spiritual are actually physical. So, yes. Yeah. Well, uh, w when I was, when I was going through this study on Gaia, I got some images from the internet. And one of the images was of a nude woman, very pregnant, and waters that filled the earth, that were the source of all the waters, was flowing from her vagina. And whenever anybody came into the house, I would hide the image. And I began to notice shame in myself around that. And I wondered what it was, and I shared with a friend about it. And he said, well, maybe you ought to paint something. So the next image is image number 13. And I call this Gaia as sexuality. So this is coming from the unconscious. All the waters of the world are coming from the vagina. And there's also blood. I began to think about the moistness in women, women's sacred moistness in arousal and sexual arousal in the birthing waters and blood. And I began to think, you know, I have a body like hers. And we all us women have these bodies that bring forth life into the world. And all these things that we may feel shame around need to be let go. The shame needs to be let go because these are beautiful things. And I have known this, this, uh, you know, loving and getting pregnant, having a baby, bleeding, carrying that life. And I could feel myself as a plant-like being, life emerging in a natural way. And all human life comes through the vagina. And so to celebrate this, to lose the shame, to celebrate the woman's body, to celebrate the divine feminine, but this is a truth to savor for all women and, and men too, to see 
the feminine body not just as a sexual object but as something really beautiful and sacred surely lately as i've been looking at young and various traditions about cosmology it strikes me that women are actually the tree of life that you know without women we don't have ongoing life so women basically have a what, what's it called a relay race to keep life alive and all of us have been dependent upon their being since sex was invented by single cell yeah. or organisms. Right. So, so all of us can point back to uh, three and a half billion years of ancestors who have in every case reproduced and survived to reproduce. Yeah. And, and that's one of the key functions of the self, the, the God image, the, the deep archetype in the unconscious. It's, its role is simply that, to keep us alive until we reproduce. And every one of our ancestors, everybody that's watching this and yours and mine and every other human being on earth, every one of our ancestors has successfully done that because we wouldn't be here if that weren't the case. It's an unbroken chain. Since it's that amazing time. when you think about it. Yeah, absolutely. Amazing. Yeah. Right, we can go to image number 14 that I call Trinity. In this picture, you can see uh, it. First of all, it's a collage that I did. And I want to tell you the story behind it first. When the divine feminine arose, now Jesus wasn't the only center of spirituality for me. There was this divine feminine. And so when I used to pray, I would imagine Jesus and I in, the, in a prayer room together, and I would be bringing my request to him, and he would be helping the people that I brought and working in different situations. But now with the Divine Feminine there, I didn't know how to pray anymore. And so I said one day out loud to Jesus, how do I pray now? And immediately I had this inner vision, and there were uh, the divine feminine melted into a pool. Jesus melted into a pool, and I melted into a pool, and we all ran together. And you can see these three clouds that are blending together here. Yeah, that's very evocative. Yes. And so there was this tremendous power, but it included me. I wasn't outside a Trinity. I was within the Trinity. I was an aspect of that. And my friend, Sister Cecilia at the Carmelite Monastery said, Christ in me living as me. Absolutely. And I, I like the words that you've got on this collage. God lives in love and God is love. Yes. Yes. Um, uh, Edward... Yeah. I wanted to mention something. I don't have a slide of this, but uh, The Christian Archetype by Edward F. Edinger, Edinger. I'd like to read something from page 34. And he said, As Jung told a patient, an experience of the transpersonal self, if it is not to cause inflation, needs a great humility to counterbalance it. You need to go down to the level of mice. <laughs> <laughs> well, that breakdown that this summer, I was at the level of mice. <laughs> oh, interesting. And so uh, recovering from that, I can't, I mean, I'm not bogged down in that sorrow and grief like I was. But it is there. And I began to feel kind of an inflation coming on yesterday. And so I sat with it and I thought, what would counter this inflation? And it was the agony of Christ on the cross. So I brought that image into that sense of inflation 
and it melted it. It stopped that energy. Mm -hmm. And so for me, that, uh, I mean, that agony of Christ on the cross, that agony matched what I was going through this summer. So I connected that, my own agony, with that archetypal image of Christ's agony. And that is a great humility. I mean, talk about defeat for Jesus, right? Right. And defeat for me. So a great defeat. So going back to my great defeat, that agony is actually now something to save me from inflation. Well, of course, Edinger and Dr. Young were both concerned that people who got the idea, if the God image takes one over and you think that you are God or the son of God, then you're going to get very inflated. Only I can solve this problem type thing. Yes. <laughs> Where we heard that yes, recently. Right. You know, if you, if you have that kind of inflation, uh, then you're riding for a fall, typically. Exactly. Uh, because a few other people might have other ideas about that. <laughs> That's <laughs> and, exactly right. And, and so we do have to maintain our humility at the same time that we have a sense that we are in communication with God. I think that that's yes, very important. I think that's so true. Yeah. And so I'd like us to look at John 17, 23. John 17, 23, Jesus is speaking again, and he says, May they, which includes you and I today, you and me today, may they be brought to complete unity to let the world know that you, God, sent me and have loved them even as you have loved me. And I feel like that is the message I bring to the world today, that in this unity, this oneness with Christ, this union with the self in love, this is for everybody. This is for all of us to know. Surely, and, and we can talk about the unity of for you and me in this video, because long after we're around, both of us have a few years left to us, I think. I hope um, so, yes. But long after we're around, then we're still going to be unified in this video. And if somebody's watching this particular part of it, they're going to see that, they, that we are unified in that respect. That's true. Good point. <laughs> We can go now to image number uh, 15, and this is uh, the chalice well covered that I found an image similar to this in Jean Shinoda Boland's book, Crossing to Avalon. And each chapter starts with a shadowed image similar to this. And it was the chalice well cover, and the chalice well is in Glastonbury, England, and there's a legend about the well there. First of all, the well flows about 25 gallons a day, and the water contains iron, which has stained the shallow uh, water course and pools red. And it suggests a sacred vessel filled with blood. And we are that. We are sacred vessels filled with blood. I needed a symbol to unite the opposites of the divine feminine and the divine masculine. So I would sit in front of this and just be present to it so that I was not present to the energies of divine feminine and divine masculine separately, but I could be with them as a symbol unites the opposites. And so I could be with this and allow the unconscious simply to feed on that to work with that, to help bring about the transformation I need, which I'm still in the process of. And so this image has become an image of wholeness for me, and I've dedicated it to the world at this time, an image of wholeness for our world. And so anyone who would like a to take a photo shot of this, a, what did they call it on the computer? A, a screenshot. A screenshot of this. Please do and use it and share it. Make yourself a picture of it and hang it in your house. 
this is wholeness. This is what God desires for us. That's what God is leading us towards, what we're moving towards. And that right. is for all of us. Right. And that's a, a symbol, of course. And we should talk a little bit about symbolism and why it's significant with our unconscious, because sometimes we can get into some severe conflicts as we have in current affairs in the United States right now. And so it's hard to see a way out, a central way out, a solution to the problem. But what happens when there's a big conflict in the psyche is that the psyche will work on it and it may not be able to say to you, this is right and this is wrong, but what it will do is it will produce a symbol of the answer. Yes. And, right, that's what your image that you've created here has done. It's basically the symbol of an answer uh, to an existential question, obviously. Yes. I was just going to say that obviously we're all trapped in the body we have and whether we're men or women and we we cannot do without the other we both need yes, the other we do gender in order to survive at all as a species and so understanding that and understanding let's say the unity of marriage or the unity of adult love is an important idea that we, among many others but there are many unities that need to be understood and better understood in terms of how to solve our problems today i guess is the way yes. to put it so the next uh, we're going to come back to this image but let's go to or let's see do I have an image? Yes, there's an image of Jean's book, Crossing to Avalon by Jean Shinoda Bolin, and I recommend this to both men and women. This is an autobiography of a particular period in Jean's life where she goes on pilgrimage, and it talks about her, the changes in her psyche and her spirituality as she goes through that. Right. So we can go back to the former image, the chalice well cover. And I'd just like to point out a few of the symbols in this symbol. The vertical line there is actually a sword. So there's a masculine element there. If we were to turn this painting sideways, that middle oval is called a mandorla, and it's a symbol of the vagina. And you'll see Jesus pictured in that particular shape in many holy pictures. And then you see the plant life that is there. Uh, I put that in to emphasize the miracle of healing I had after nine and a half years of severe illness, having a dream from which I woke up well. And that I made a quilt to celebrate that healing. And those are the colors of the quilt in the plant life there. Right. So I began to wonder what's happening to me spiritually because I, I didn't have that focus of Jesus. My focus was getting blurry and opening to something new and it was very disconcerting. So I had a talk with a spiritual director I had known many years ago who is also has studied Jung and got his DMIN degree in Jungian psych, Union psychology and spiritual direction. And after I told him what I was experiencing, he said, you are in union with the self that holds the opposites. And I, I don't know exactly what he meant by that, but uh, it is an aspect of the sacred marriage. It is an aspect of, the conjunctio, I guess you would say, if it seems like conjunctio maybe comes, for me at least, in stages. This was a tremendous opening this summer. This, you know, bowled me over. And I'm, I'm like a different person inside, outside, spiritually. I don't know where I'm going or being taken. I don't know who I am in a certain sense. But I have a deep peace that I'm being enlarged. 
uh, a counselor told me, a Jungian analyst told me recently that the soul is expanding within, there's more space. Uh, I'm better able to deal with old trauma that's coming up and releasing it because the great mother is holding me. Yes. And so I can, I can handle being with the pain and I can handle processing it. Right. I, you know, it's interesting. It's not in Christianity, but here's an image from uh, Taoism. And I always think that this is sort of the best image, not necessarily the male-female part of the, this particular image, but the yin-yang image is really kind of the best image of wholeness where it represents movement around in a circle, but we're, you know, basically we're in touch with the self. So we're in touch with both sides of ourselves. And so I often think that that image is actually uh, the most appropriate one, the yin yang symbol. Oh, that was lovely. We're coming to the end. The last thing I want to do next is to read this, po this prayer by Merton. And that will be all I'll have to say. So yeah. if okay. you want to say something else. So this is a painting of Thomas Merton that was done by Sister Marie Celeste of the Carmelites here in Reno. And as we close today, I want to read this prayer by Merton that I think is a very human prayer and yet a faith-filled prayer for us. My Lord, I have no idea where I am going. I do not see the road ahead of me. I cannot know for certain where it will end, nor do I really know myself. And the fact that I think I am following your will does not mean that I am actually doing so. But I believe that de the desire to please you does in fact please you. And I hope I have that desire in all that I am doing. I hope that I will never do anything apart from that desire. And I know that if I do this, you will lead me by the right road, though I may know nothing about it. Therefore will I trust you always, though I may seem to be lost, and in the shadow of death I will not fear, for you are ever with me, and you will never leave me to face my perils alone. That's very powerful. And the thing that I wanted, would want to mention about that is that Dr. Edinger points out that no matter what we think about prayer, it should always be a petition to our unconscious. And that's something that even a non-believer can do. Yes. And and if you think of that prayer in the context of petitioning your unconscious to get you through the thick and thin, yes. you know, regardless of what your faith tradition is, it can be very helpful. And and petitions to the unconscious do get answered. Prayers get answered because your unconscious is part of yourself. So regardless of what you think about metaphysical facts about God, it is true from a psychological point of view that these things work and prayer works and prayer is something that's in every faith tradition and in some form or another. And we all, we all should find a way to, connect with that part of ourselves or, you know, we, we all should have a method, let's say, that lets us get in touch with that part of ourselves, whether it's through meditation or prayer or yoga or whatever it is. And, and if you're not a Christian faith believer that, you know, praise to heaven, uh, at least you can know that from a psychological point of view, you should be praying to your deep unconscious, which is keeping you alive and has kept your ancestors alive for the last three and a half billion years. 
Yes. And, and so you want to communicate back with that part of yourself, regardless of what you think about metaphysics. Thanks, Kip. Thanks for sharing that. That's one of the reasons I chose that particular prayer. Mm -hmm. it, it would be good for anyone. Yeah. And when I came across Dr. Edinger talking about the Lord's Prayer and how the Lord's Prayer contains actually seven petitions to the unconscious, it really had a deep meaning for me. And there are actually three videos on the YouTube channel about uh, petitions contained in the Lord's Prayer, so I'm not going to go into it here. But that's a, that's a valuable thing to know about and to understand yes. because it's not necessarily a Christian prayer. It's a prayer that is a petition to your own unconscious to help you out in times of trouble in various ways. Yes. Yeah. Well, thank you, Skip. This has been a wonderful time together. Yeah, this is a, a powerful experience, Nancy. I must say that it's way beyond what I had ever hoped it would be. And I'm really impressed by what we've both achieved here. Yes. I mean, obviously, you more, more than I, but and, uh, thanks to our friend Jerome Waddell for yes. also having contributed by putting together the slides for the, this talk that's been also very helpful and I think that the whole series people can all benefit by it no doubt and listen to it multiple times to have a you know to have an anchor to find an anchor to find a connection back to religion and as I said in my talk of finding the living God the answer for humanity is really to go back to the traditional religions and take give them another look from another perspective because you know especially for people who've lost their faith because they are naturally evolved systems for mental health and at the very least they can help you with your own happiness and so it's a very powerful idea, and, uh, and it's very powerful what you've done in terms of putting this together as a Christian in individuation, because you know, before we started, I couldn't have imagined how that would work and how it would bolster my own faith or knowing of uh, what Christianity represents in my life and the lives of my wife, children, and grandchildren, uh, but I certainly have a better view of it now, thanks to you, and I really appreciate that. Well, I'm thanks, sure. Skip. And I know there are many others that look forward to uh, these videos, and, you know, I've, I was dilatory. I, I have to apologize because I was dilatory in putting together our original interviews and did I mean you you said that that was a good thing but you know I think you're being kind too and but the the power of what we have going now not only with you but other members of our advanced reading group is really amazing and it is and it we've is. you know there have been several others that have contributed interviews that are extremely powerful and useful in different yes. ways right. so anyway thank you very much uh, for doing this nancy and you're uh, welcome skip when you think of a, when you think of more to talk about let me know because okay. you know we can do an addendum <laughs> right when um you know the funny thing is uh back in may when we had our first interview I really did not appreciate how troubled you personally were and how near to death you thought you were and so on. And I really didn't know whether I was talking to someone who was, who 
was in the process of dying, honestly. What I now know is, oh, by the way, you're only four years older than me, and uh, we, we have, uh, we're, we're not even in our 80s yet, and we'll, lots of people that are living into their hundreds these days. That's so true. we may have we may have a long way to go and lots <laughs> more to talk about over coming years. And and so I think you should think of it in that in that way. Okay. Stop uh stop this what pity party. <laughs> Pity party idea of, oh, woe is me, you know. We have to stop doing the pity party and we have to start well, we, we, finding the thing, life. The, the point is to move towards life. Absolutely. Life is moving in us and through us, and we want to be in that stream. And because of my experience this summer, I, I have to be in the stream you know before i had a choice now i have to be in the stream right so even brushing my teeth if i am tired and don't you know just don't see how i'm going to brush those teeth i'll just lay down for a few minutes until i get a little energy and then i'll go brush my teeth well i was just saying that the main thing is that we move towards life if we're moving towards life we're in union with the self we're in union with, um, we're heading towards our fullest self, and this is good, and this is, and we will feel better, and and more synchronicities will come into our life. Definitely, definitely. So the choices against life are really, uh, a, that's what I call a sin, choices against life. Absolutely, and you know, as, as I've been doing this and getting to know all of you and just paying more and more attention to synchronicities in my life, it's nearly overwhelming, actually, the, the number of them that hit me. And I just go, oh, my God, you know. I know. I know. <laughs> you just have to be sensitive to them. And oh, my heavens. Well, I hope you're encouraged, you know, in terms of your own work, what it did for this one person here. Definitely. My heavens, I had no idea that it was making such a difference. And, and I am really encouraged and I appreciate you bringing it to my attention because obviously I've been doing this work in one way or another for a very long time. I, you know, in terms of going back to my writing, we're talking 15 years that I've been trying to find a way to break through and, and help others to see what I'm talking about. And, you know, especially the things that have come up in our interviews, not only with you, but with our other advanced reading group members have definitely started to show me that my work makes a difference. I, I've seen little snippets of it in the past. One time uh, I said a certain phrase that I knew was a very unique phrase, and I didn't think anybody would ever say and three days later, I saw, I saw the President of the United States say the same phrase on video, on oh television. My.